Hey everyone, it's Jacqueline Melanick. Welcome to Chain Reaction, a show that unpacks and dives deep into the latest trends, drama, and news, breaking things down block by block for the crypto curious. This year, we're doing monthly series, diving into different topics and themes in crypto. And to start things off this month, we're focusing on NFTs. I'm interviewing some of the biggest NFT players and founders about how they've weathered the booms and busts in this sector, what they're focused on, and what could be next for the industry. Hope you enjoy. Today's guest is Yatsu, co-founder and executive chairman of Animoca Brands. Yat co-founded Animoca in 2014 and since then has invested in over 400 Web3 projects across a range of sectors like DeFi, education, infrastructure, marketplaces, blockchain gaming, and metaverse to name a few. Animoca also has its own NFT collections, blockchain products, and games like its Web3 NFT-based community Mochaverse, the blockchain game and NFT collection Rev Racing, and the Sandbox, a decentralized virtual world with over 40 million mobile installs. In addition to all of this, Animoca has worked with other well-known brands and personalities like Disney, WWE, Power Rangers, The Walking Dead, Formula E, and Snoop Dogg. Hopefully you know some of those names. With all of that said, there's a lot we can discuss here. So yeah, welcome to the show. Thank you for having me. It's a real great pleasure to be here. Yeah. And to start, you've met a lot of people. You work with a lot of companies. So I'm excited to hear your answer on this one. But can you tell us about one of the most interesting people you've met in crypto in the past 12 months? And what did you learn from them? Oh, interesting people in crypto. Well, I would say first, like I think everyone in crypto is kind of interesting because to be in a space, you kind of have to be a little bit sort of kooky and wild and sort of rebellious, <laughs> shall we say. So I would say that right. generally speaking, I think everyone in the space is is interesting. I think one of the people that I would say that probably was a lot of fun to talk to is probably Arthur Hayes. He was he was a lot of fun just in the sense that he kind of has a sort of a degen mentality, obviously very smart about the space as well. No holds barred kind of conversations. And also in, you know, we most recently had a, a roundtable conversation that was fun as well. So yeah, so you know, I would say generally speaking, I mean, there's so many people, so I, I don't really want to single anyone out in particular, but he's the first person that comes to mind just because of his personality and everything he's been through. Yeah, for sure. I've met Arthur as well, and he's a very interesting person. So if you don't know who he is, go look him up. But we've spoken in the past, yeah, about all the themes I mentioned in the intro, and I know there was a lot there, and there's many ways we could drive this conversation. But I wanted to begin by asking you more about your perspective on what digital property rights are and why does it matter and how do NFTs play into that? And then we could go from there. Well, I mean, digital property rights to us, we think is fundamental uh, in the sense that it is something that we weren't able to do before in the world of, I guess, Web 2 and even Web 1, meaning that we now have a way in which we can really own our digital assets. And if you think about so, and which in consequence also means our sort of ownership in our digital time and attention and the things that we do. And we kind of think of it from the perspective of what is really ours. Like in the physical world, we used to think that what was ours is obviously not just the place we live in, but you know, the work that we do and the crafts that we create and the items that we make. And so it's physical in nature. And then, you know, in a kind of classic Lockean sense, you could say that what we craft with the hands is sort of our own, our own creation. But of course, you know, Locke's idea is about, you know, hundreds of years old, uh, actually more like four or 500 years old. So really, when we're thinking about sort of the context of today, we no longer create things with the labor of our hands. We actually create things with our mind, with our ideas, with our time and attention. And that actually creates really large quantities of valuable data. And that valuable data, however, although it ought to be ours, isn't actually ours anymore in the world of Web2 because we willingly give it away because we don't actually quite know how to value it. And so mm -hmm. what's happened is, is that we've been farmed for our time and attention and we don't have any of these rights that we've created in terms of the data that we create for the platforms. So we think that every time you use Instagram or every time you use TikTok, you're actually working for the platform and you're not really getting paid much of anything for it at all. And so that, in sense, we think we live in a kind of digital feudal age. And that to us is kind of the world that we exist in right now. And so Web3 solves that because in the same way that you own your Bitcoin, which is sort of, I guess you could say, the first innovation of how you can really own a sovereign digital asset, regardless of its value, we can now do this with all of our things in the digital online world. And I think NFTs are particularly valuable in this case because they are non-fungible, meaning that they're unique. 
And in our physical life, everything really around us is unique in a sense. The clothes we wear, the identity we have, the wedding rings we have, you know, like all these things, we, we customize our homes, right? We make them ours. We, we create our stories and our cultures around them. And so NFTs are these digital stores of culture that we can then transfer on. And when you have ownership, it means that actually people can start to compose freely on top of them, as we do in the physical world. And the example we always give is when you actually own a car, I can come to you as the owner of the car and say, let me make a baby seat for you, or let me hire your driver, or can I go to service for you? And, you know, can I wash your car, right? Like, I can do all these things, and I don't have to talk to the creator of the car for permission to do any of this, or pay a tax. But right? I mean, it's kind of like today in the Web2 world, it's like, if I want to wash someone's car, I got to pay Volkswagen maybe a 30% fee, or I'm going to pay Tesla a 30% fee, or whatever platform fee that they generate, because, you know, we don't really own it, right? That's what Apple and what Facebook and these companies do. And, and we've really come to a world where in Web2, we exist in these platforms as, you know, they're rentier networks. They're basic platforms where we constantly pay rent just to exist on mm -hmm. them. So we don't own anything. And in Web3, basically, we can have that ownership. And it ultimately boils down to us about ownership of data and the derivative that data creates. Because if it wasn't for our data, we wouldn't have ChatGPT, we wouldn't have OpenAI, we wouldn't have self-driving cars. And yet all of this activity that we or value that we generated, how much do we get? And the answer is nothing. So, so this is sort of why I think Web3 is so important, especially given the fact that AI is going to become such a prevalent part of our lives. And yet we you know, have no control or ownership over any of it. Well, don't you think in a way that ownership is kind of, I mean, it's nominal in Web2. We see it with like, X, Twitter, whatever you want to call it. They give back ad revenue to some creators. TikTok does that. YouTube has some things like that. Even Spotify, you know, gives music creators some percentage. And yes, it is smaller than what Web3 would typically give. But how do you kind of see that bridge closing between the two? The fundamental of any property rights, regardless of whether it's digital or physical, is that it's sovereignly yours, as it's your sovereign ownership. And you decide what to do with it. And you decide the fees. And you decide whether you can or cannot sell it and all the rights attached to it. And the problem in Web2 is you don't have any of these rights. And the other problem, of course, is that if you think that you own your Instagram handle or your X handle, think again. I mean, the person who used to own the ad music handle just lost it just because yep. Elon said, I want to go into the music business. And the person who owned the ad X handle, he lost it too. And for those of you who may not remember, the lady in Australia who used to own the Metaverse handle when Facebook renamed itself Meta, she briefly lost her handle as well because... Uh, you know, Facebook was accusing her of impersonating a company which had just renamed itself literally the month right. before. So it's impossible, yeah. Yeah, exactly. And, and you know, when the largest game company, one of the largest game companies in the world, um, Epic in this case, can't even launch their app on the App Store because Apple says they don't, basically don't like their commercial mm -hmm. terms or whatever it is. And I don't think we exist in a world where we actually have any property rights whatsoever. I think there's a very fundamental difference. Payment aspect aside, right? And that means also that we don't have a market, right? So the point of property rights is that you actually, the foundation of, of capitalism is property rights. And so the irony, of course, is that right now, actually, in Web2, you could argue that actually, we no longer have a free market either, because we don't get to decide the prices, we don't get to decide what is discovered. In fact, when you're thinking about sort of the discovery of Spotify from a music standpoint, it recommends music to you, not necessarily just based on what's the best taste for you, but maybe what makes most money for Spotify. And the kind of ads that you see or the kind of sort of, you know, products that, that have been promoted to you are not necessarily the ones that you really want uh, or create a market. It's actually the ones that the platform thinks are most beneficial, including the kind of news that you should see that create maybe the most clicks or the most reactions or whatever that might be. So, so I don't think um, we have any property rights in Web 2. I think there's fundamentally a very, very big difference between Web 2 and Web 3. Put another way, if any one of these platforms have a change of heart in what you do in terms of, you know, you know we've experienced this ourselves. I mean, all of our apps at one point got removed from the App Store because Apple didn't like something about us. And we don't, you know, we, we never actually really got a full answer, actually any answer as to what that was, right? And I don't think any one of us want to live in a place where our homes can literally be taken away and our property can be removed just because we, you know, not because we've done any crime or anything, just because someone doesn't like it. And and that's exactly the way that we live in Web 2. And that's why I think Web 3 is, uh, is so important. I agree with you on that. And I think property rights are so important and being able to like own your brand and have it on a platform without losing it is so significant too like whether it's the app store or Twitter or wherever it may be. And I know in the past, you and I have talked about building a brand and it's hard to build a brand, I'm sure, without a community. And this is something that a lot of crypto projects day in and day out have to deal with and cultivating a community, launching a project, cultivating community, 
and all of these different things to build a brand is kind of, in my opinion, what makes some companies or NFT collections, whatever it may be, stand out. And as someone who has invested in hundreds of projects, I'm curious what makes NFT projects stand out to you when there are thousands of NFT collections out there, especially during the hype of it all, people were trying to get in. How do you decide which NFT projects to invest in and look at? So actually, we've done over 450 investments so far, and that continues to Mm -hmm. accelerate. And one of the big reasons why we believe the strategy of investing the way that we do makes sense is because we believe in the shared network effect that Web3 can provide. And that comes from the basis that all of us actually can become our own platforms. And because we have property rights attached to them, now when you have property rights to whatever it is that you do, you actually become a platform of your own. Sometimes the example I give is that of a restaurant. You know, you could be McDonald's, which is a really, really big platform, or you could be a Michelin star restaurant, which could be a platform for just a thousand people. They charge maybe higher fees, but they are a platform. They own the product, they own the brand. It is, you know, you go there for the experience that is, you know, the one that you want to have with that individual or that group of people. And you don't have to go through an intermediary and pay a tax every time to basically share that experience. And so NFT projects exist in the same way. So when you, whether you look at Land and Sandbox, whether you look at Mochaverse, or whether you look at a Board Ape, for instance, when you own one Board Ape, you're a member of that entire community. And the ownership of all of these NFTs in that community or subset of that community becomes a platform in and of itself. And it becomes a platform because I'm able to tell its value in the market because it is an open market. For instance, I might be prepared to, you know, give more benefits or special services to someone who owns a board ape because I know that you know he has assets between fifty to hundred thousand dollars. And in the same way that if you were able to target every Rolex owner or every Lamborghini owner, for instance, directly and you knew how to do that, you probably give them special discounts or benefits or services as well because you want to attract that customer. One of the problems we have in Web2 is that you might have, I don't know, a million followers on the Rolex uh, you know, brand page and you want to target those guys. But we definitely know that there's not a million people who own a Rolex, right? <laughs> you know, all the people who are actually in the Rolex Facebook page or Instagram page mm-hmm. don't actually have one. Maybe you don't even know if they're, if they're serious about it. Yeah, they might just be into them. <laughs> exactly, exactly. So how do you actually address the ones who really own it or have a true interest? And that's basically what mm-hmm. NFTs do. They, they provide that authenticity, that ownership, and that sort of authentic layer of knowing that he's a real person for which they then receive benefits. And then what happens is that because you know it's a real user, the benefits come to you as opposed to you having to use a middleman to basically try to find a way to reach them, which is you know what's happening um, in the Web2 world today. <laughs> so in gaming, you know, which is a big space focused on it, there's a perfect example. Gaming spends... You know, like I think uh, CPA or CPI ads uh, were something like $100 billion last year, which is a lot of money for a $200 billion industry. And what's interesting about that, of course, is that we know that when they spend all this money in advertising, less than one or two or 3% actually really convert into a paying customer, which basically means that a huge amount of money, as we know, in the freemium space is basically spent on people that actually you know, don't have any real value. We don't even know how to address them. And how many times have you seen the same ad over and over again? <laughs> right. So the point, yeah. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> so the point is, is that the platforms live off the fact that we actually advertise inefficiently and they don't really want to target you directly, whether it's opt-in or not. That doesn't really matter, right? So now what happens in Web3, you know, in the form of airdrops or free NFTs, what actually happens is they say, hey, if you're a true owner of a sandbox land or a true owner of a mocha burst or board ape, I'm going to give you a freebie. Now, the whole point of the freebie, whether it's an NFT or whether it's tokens or whatever that is, isn't just, hey, let's give out free money. It's an incentive to bring the customer to you to become your customer potentially. And actually, you're paying money to the person or you're giving value to the person you want, as opposed to using a platform in the middle that takes a giant fee. And of course, they say, oh, but we only take 30% or 40% of the fee. But the reality is they're actually taking much more because it's so inefficient. Whereas if I really know it and you have that NFT, you can you know, do your claim. And now I can, at the moment you do your claim, I can teach you about my product and I can attract you. And you're happy to do it because instead of me having paid thousands or tens of thousands of dollars to Google, I end up basically paying that kind of value to the end user that I really want to attract. And that's basically where the whole world of you know targeting, advertising, marketing that sort of appends itself. Because at the end of the day, every NFT platform, every individual actually, has the ability to become a platform by themselves. And when you look at, for instance, even what Facebook does with Instagram, Every time you have your followers on Instagram, 
Yet you don't know who all these followers are, but actually you are a platform. You've created a social platform, whether it's between the friends you know or the network around you, except that they've disintermediated it sufficiently such that you can't actually take your users with you because you're stuck there. And so actually all you did was enrich their platform. And next thing you know, suddenly you become dependent on their platform because when you leave, you have not just this impossible switching cost, you actually lose your entire business, right? So, so this is actually a problem that happens in the Web2 web space. And another thing that I want to sort of highlight as well, and I think this is the biggest problem we have in Web2, is that when you think of all the money that's spent on these platforms, you know, be it Apple, Facebook, Google, Microsoft, whatever, you know, they charge a platform fee, which is like 30%. And then they charge you all this advertising, which you have to pay for. All this value, how much of that money goes back into the ecosystems which empowered them? The answer is almost nothing. You know, of the billions of dollars that we spend on advertising in these platforms, how much of them go back into the gaming industry, for instance? Does Apple or Google or Facebook invest in the gaming industry? And the answer is, of course, no, right? In fact, they don't invest in their own app store ecosystem, which I think is ridiculous, right? So what do you think would be the solution for that then? The solution to that is that in Web3 anyway, because you are part of the same network, that regardless and uh, sort of very much anti-monopolistic qualities, what happens is that even if you don't have success in your own product, the fact that your success, someone else succeeds on the Ethereum network or in Polygon or whatever that system may be, the entire network shares in that network effect as a result. And we've seen this effect, by the way, with Axie Infinity and Pixels on the Ronin chain, for instance. Right? You're basically building on a shared network. And the way that you we think that the right approach is, therefore, you can't expect sort of a zero-sum outcome. In fact, we think the days of zero-sum in Web3 are basically gone. Right? You can't have a single winner because everyone in the platform wins as a result of being a member of that platform, which is kind of how we think it should work. And I think the, the model, of course, is that in the Web2 world or the corporate world, this idea that you make a, you know, you maximize your profit, but actually you're not putting back into the ecosystem is a bad model. You know, take a look at, for instance, Apple's cash balance. What, $163 billion? <laughs> you know, it's some crazy. It's a lot. Yeah, it's a lot. <laughs> Whatever it is. And yeah. then I was reading somewhere that the top 13, the big 13 biggest companies in it are sitting on about a mm-hmm. trillion dollars of cash. A trillion dollars of cash, right? Yeah. And so the question we have to ask ourselves is that trillion dollars, is it productive or what is it doing? And it's sitting somewhere in Ireland, tax optimized with some, you know, trading interest rates. <laughs> but the reality is, is that if they even took just 10% or 5%, let's take 5% of the cash and reinvested it into the ecosystems that made them, right? We think two things will happen. One, the investments will actually be more valuable than the cash deployment itself. Because, of course, when you think of Apple, and if they had invested in many of the earliest you know, companies that succeeded in the App Store, they would have made more money than the capital that they would have invested. But number two, they would have created a healthier ecosystem, a more balanced ecosystem, and everyone would be much more happier paying 30% fees to Apple or Google, whoever it is that they pay, because they're putting back into the ecosystem. Right? It's not so entirely extractive. Uh, and so we think that's the model for Web3, which is also the reason why we make so many investments and we don't stop doing it, because we think of it in the same way, which is that if we make money from the ecosystem, the way that we create value isn't only by sort of, you know, like taking money out of the system. That's actually, we think, bad. But actually by reinvesting in the ecosystem, we win both ways. Because even if the business or two that we invested in did not succeed, actually the entire ecosystem ended up benefiting as a whole. Now, we're not the app store. So the way that we created this network effect for ourselves is we invested so broadly in the space that we're effectively almost like a Web3 index because we were with all the L1 and L2s. So we can be sort of chain agnostic. But in Apple's case, right, I mean, imagine if they took $10 billion, right, of their cash hoard and decided to reinvest it in building the App Store ecosystem, especially the indie developers to help grow that. But you would create a flourishing ecosystem as opposed to one that basically died. No indie developer will tell you that he can make money on App Store anymore. He doesn't have a way of being discovered. He's kind of hidden somewhere. He doesn't have the marketing dollars to do any of that, right? Right. And I think this is a big problem we have in the world, broadly speaking. And one of the reasons why I think Web3 and crypto is also so much so, uh, rising the way that it is, because it is the only way in which the, you know, let's call it a person who isn't privileged actually has an opportunity today. I mean, even with AI, think about sort of the incredible opportunities that AI purport to give us. How can anyone except the VCs in the world participate in that opportunity? And the answer is they can't. Like we can't invest. On this. By, I mean, being the users. Yeah, but, yeah. by being the user, and guess what? <laughs> we get some benefit by using the right. service, but we give so much more back into the system with our data, with our prompts, 
with the questions, right? So actually, these systems are designed to farm us, right? And that I think, and again, I think you know, Web three is really the only answer to create a world that's more fair and equitable, which is um, which comes from the fact that we can have property rights. The foundation of that is that we have actual ownership of our things, and then we can decide the market prices and the value for it, as opposed to the platform that basically just it disintermediates us. That was a lot, yeah. I loved it. <laughs> and I think it, it stemmed originally from the brand conversation. And I'm still thinking about what you said, where it's like you could be a McDonald's or a Michelin company. And, you know, both are equally, maybe not equally, but they're both important to different audiences and communities. And I know in the beginning, I mentioned that Animoca has worked with like Disney, Snoop Dogg, The Walking Dead, other big companies. I'm curious, why would you do that? Do you think it's to get those communities into Web3? And how important is it yes. for other Web3 companies to do the same if they have you know, the funds to do so? So generally speaking, we're most excited about what we call Web3 native brands. Right. So if you look at our investments, actually, we invested with its Cool Cats or Yuga Labs with Board Apes. Yeah. Basically, all of these direct communities, you know, San Francisco, Tokyo, like those are the networks that we're super excited about because we think that they're actually going to really make a difference because also the brand IP is co-owned by the community, which is really exciting as well. So we think that's the better future. But we also work with the big brands because one, they're really hungry to enter the sort of the, the Web3 space, you know, because they obviously see opportunity. But the second one also is, is that they have the trust of the Web2 community who don't actually know much about Web3. And so we can bring them in. And it's interesting that the fashion and luxury brands, curiously enough, are the ones that actually understand the space the best. I think my talks, I often give the comparison between a board ape and a Birkin bag. And, you know, for a lot of people, they often get <laughs> right. confused by that. And, it's, and then when I tell people, well, do you buy a Birkin bag? you know, to put stuff in it. And then people go, oh yeah, now I get it. Now I understand why, you know, the value of an NFT, you know, for status and for social identity, for access to membership in the community and for culture, right? That's when people start to get it. Because actually, if you think about probably most of what you buy in the physical world, how much is it for its raw utility? I mean, we don't buy cars to take us from point A to point like B. Like expensive items, exactly. right? Yeah. Even, you know, relatively cheap items. I mean, I think when you look at shoes, like whether it's from Adidas or whether it's from Nike or whether it's from Puma or from Asics, I mean, these are utility shoes, you could say, that roughly priced the same. Yeah. Not talking about the expensive ones, right? But we're attached to the brand. Some people only buy Nike and some people only buy Puma or whatever that is. And it's not expensive, but it's an expression of who they are, right? They're like, oh, I'm a Nike guy, whatever that means. Or I'm a Puma <laughs> guy, or I'm an Asics guy. And some people like to wear expensive stuff, and some people actually don't, right? They shun that. They're a little bit like, oh, you know, I'm going to wear not so expensive stuff to tell people that I'm not like that, right? In fact, if you tell people like that to say, oh, would you like to wear Gucci? They go, no way in hell, because it doesn't right. fit their brand. So the point is that we're all purchasing things to actually express our identity in one form or the other. And it doesn't always mean that it has to be expensive, right? And so I think the digital world is where we express ourselves most of the time, especially the younger generation. You know, it's more important what skins we have, or it's more important how we're viewed in the digital world. It's more important how many followers and how many likes we have on Instagram than it might be where we were physically seen or the places we've been because of the fact that that's where our social status lies. So the traditional brands, however, they understand that virtual aspect very well, particularly fashion brands. And so they've been one of the first movers into the space. But, you know, working with the big brands is also a, a marketing method, right? It's And frankly, that's how they, how they make money. They work with the brand to attract the trust of the customer and then they basically they come in into the Web3 world. And I have to say, you know, it has mixed results, right? Brands who work with you well, the success has been very strong. And I think we've seen early examples of that. In like, for instance, when Dapper Labs and, you know, worked in one of our other portfolios, worked with the NBA for NBA Top Shot. That was sort of one of the first moments and where, you know, a mass audience started to understand, oh, wait a second, what's an NFT? What does it all mean, right? But I think we've evolved since then, right? And we work closely with brands like MotoGP and Formula E, to sort of try to replicate similar type of scenarios. And we also do, you know, advertising. So we've had some big billboard advertising on sort of some MotoGP race billboards, for instance, to try to promote to a wider audience. You know, we don't do this necessarily because we think they are directly revenue generating. We do this sometimes just for broader awareness uh, as well, just to try to, you know, basically get more people into the space and, and make them aware of that. So I think that's, you know, something that all of us have to do in, in one form or the other. But we are mostly excited about sort of Web3 native brands and sort of the, the new businesses that... And, and, you know, I'll close with this thought, which is I think that NFTs allow us and the whole digital property rights space allow us to create 
a much more diverse ecosystem. Because now you can actually have a sustainable Web3 business, even if it's small, whether it's an NFT collection, whether it's a game system, that might only have thousands or tens of thousands of customers. I mean, just think about some of the NFT collections that are out there. They don't have a million customers, right? In Web2, you can't succeed unless you have 10 million customers. But in Web3, you can be a sustainable business with thousands or tens of thousands because there's more value that's shared because you have capital formation. And that's kind of the example. If you're, you know, you might be very happy creating very exquisite sort of experiences for a thousand customers. We do not complain going to a Michelin star restaurant, paying the kind of fees that we do because right. we cherish the experience. As ridiculous it might seem, but why would you spend that much money for a single meal? But it delights us. You know, we enjoy that culture and we come out somehow en enriched by it. And the same is true for NFTs, right? When you talk to people who own NFTs, they, they don't think of it purely as utility. They think of it as culture and community and access. And I think that we'll, be, we'll have many, many thousands more of these brands out there that can now flourish because of NFTs. Yeah, I also think with the Michelin Note, it's like something you could put on social media. Say you've gone there, experienced things, That's right. expose yourself to new things, and same applies to NFTs. I'm curious, what other characteristics do you think NFTs have that other crypto sectors do not use and should adopt? Yes. One of the biggest areas that we've been pushing strong on NFTs, and we've, we've started doing this with teachers and educators, is around creating essentially contract rights that allow essentially for intellectual property protection and intellectual property capital formation. So one of the biggest problems that we have in you know, the physical property rights space is that in order to have an asset that can have capital formation and value creation, it needs to be a certain size. So maybe like a house or maybe a music that makes like a million dollars a year or something. That's worth it because you have to you know, hire a lawyer, they have to sign a contract, they have to protect it, they have to defend it, they have to do all these things to make sure that the asset is worth protecting and investing in. Which means that only things that have a certain dollar value can actually be turned into capital assets. But what if you are living in a place like Venezuela or like Philippines, where your monthly salary is maybe 10 or $15? And you might create some content or asset that actually might give a yield because people will use it, like what we're doing with teachers, like with TinyTab and Open Campus, where they're making maybe $10 or $15 a year in addition. Now, that's a nice side income, but you can't do capital formation with this in a traditional sense well, as a yield instrument because no lawyer will do that work because it'll cost way too much money for a lawyer to do the contract than the actual asset is worth. But with an NFT, you can do all of that in a single transaction. The IP rights intellectual property rights, where the money goes, everything can be done in a transaction that's less than a dollar. So that means that when you have something that's worth 10 or $15 a year, you can now sell it for $50 to $100 because now it's an asset that makes, I don't know, 10, 15, maybe 20% yield, depending on what it is. And we've seen that effect when teachers in these countries have started making assets where they're making you know, a small yield. And then investors from all over the world have said, hey, you know, I'm going to buy this. I can make more value out of this, but either way, I think it's valuable because it gives me a 10 or 15 or 20% yield, actual yield that's happening. And so we think that kind of encapsulation of IP rights can actually extend, you know, not just for teachers and educators, but just for everyone who's creating intellectual property. There's a large amount of intellectual property that can't be capitalized and protected because it wasn't worth it. But now with NFTs, you can. I'll give you one more example, for instance, with one of another portfolio called Dance Fight. They are actually protecting their IP rights with dance moves. Now that sounds almost like whimsical and funny, you know, right. like, you know, street dancers basically protecting their rights to dance moves. But, you know, one of the creators, he shared his story and he said, you know, he loved to play Fortnite. And then one day, you know, his, his dance move, which was on TikTok, was became an emoticon, I mean, became an emoji and a move on Fortnite. And he didn't pay. Fortnite basically stole his dance move and he couldn't prove it because they just took it on TikTok and he couldn't prove that he created yeah. or the data was minted or whatever it was. And so now with, you know, blockchain, you can make a dance move, you can immortalize it as an NFT at a date in which you did it so that you can no longer argue, well, when was it created? I don't know if you really did you create it or what's the background? Because now, the, you know, an on-chain dynamic proves when you did it, how you did it and what it is that you did. So that if someone afterwards was going to say they took that, then at least you can, you know, have a trademark or copyright claim. You know, in places like the US, you don't have to go to an office to do that if you can prove original creation. So these are other ways in which you can basically start to defend your rights that really sort of empowers everyone to do that. And I think, again, in this age of AI, it's so much so important because, you know, how do you verify whether this art is really from you? How do we verify that I'm actually talking to the true Jackie, for instance? <laughs> 
right? Uh, as an example. <laughs> it's or me, that you, yeah. Right? Exactly. Yeah, that's exactly, a good question, right? right? You know, when you can forge it and, and so easily with, you know, basically AI today. And so this is where blockchain and NFTs are important because now I can tell if it's really you because there's a hash, there's a key, there's a right. signature attached to it. And also royalty rights. If I use an AI and I generate something new out of the value of a thousand people or 10,000 people or say even a million people, right? Actually, you know, which mechanism exists today in Web2 where you can actually properly account for that in an open and transparent manner where nobody will question the value that's generated? And again, on-chain dynamics is the best way of doing that because it's fully auditable and you can share the value according to whatever algorithm you've designed for everyone to see. So there's a lot of reasons why I think you know, blockchain technology will help solve many of the world's biggest problems that are, you know, uh, incoming. Why do you think it hasn't been adopted yet, though? Do you think it's the negative connotation that has come with the word NFTs or just the Web3 space as a whole? Or is it a lack of understanding and accessibility, education? I mean, there's a lot of ways we could, like, say why it hasn't, but I'm curious where yeah, you stand so on it. A couple, couple things. I mean, I had a interesting several conversations with actually Simon Sinek about this. And he, he, well, he said one of the first things we probably should do as an industry is drop the word NFT and probably drop the word metaverse. <laughs> we have heard this <laughs> right? many times, yeah. Yes, uh, and, and I think there's a good reason behind that because, you know, it's it's a classic example of sort of, you know, putting a technical term, you know, after all, non-fungible token doesn't really describe our industry very well. But I think also there's this little thing that the word itself has been tainted and has been confused. So when we talk about the metaverse, for instance, you know, we talk about digital property rights. Meta or Facebook talks about VR, AR, you know, Microsoft talks about something else. You know, Apple says metaverse is, you know, rubbish. We talk about sort of, you know, spatial computing. Like whatever whatever the terms might be, there is no common framework of agreement around sort of what that word is. So in some ways, I think as an industry, you probably need to sort of find a new term that sort of encapsulates really what it means, which is why we've been focusing a little bit more on sort of so much more on the topic of digital property rights. But property rights in and of itself does sound a little bit sort of, you know, again, a bit technical and, and so something that most people might not fully appreciate. In Asia, though, NFTs and blockchain is actually very much more adopted. It's much more popular and it doesn't have those negative connotations. So adoption is much faster compared to the West. Uh, partially, it has a little bit to do, obviously, with the scandals of the past and the problems about the industry and the fear that this uh, sort of generated. But I would say one of the bigger issues that I'm seeing, particularly when it comes to gaming, you know, when people are rejecting NFTs in gaming in the West as opposed to in the East, where it's welcomed, you notice that the reaction isn't a logical one. It's a very emotional one, right? I mean, they're, they're sort of seething from the mouth, right? They're angry, they get red, right? They talk about, you know, they, they talk about it like it's like, the worst thing ever. You know, if they don't care, who cares? Like in some ways, you could argue, if you don't like NFTs, it's okay. No skin off your back. Why would you be so bothered by it, right? But it's very personal to them. And I think one of the big reasons why it feels so personal is because of the fact that it involves money. And of course, everything in the world involves money, but in this sense, it feels like digital capitalism come home in a very sort of big way. And in America, for instance, I think, you know, we see this with, you know, the political movements as well, that especially amongst young Americans, a large group of them, they've become fairly anti-capitalist in their perspectives. And, you know, now even, you know, wh which way you swing in terms of the socialist direction, it's become a political platform because capitalism hasn't done well for you and hasn't done well for most people of the younger generation. And money and capital starts to feel feudal, as in, if I have money, I make more money. I have power. I have access. It's as opposed to someone who doesn't, right? So in the same way that people were very negative towards people in the finance industry, if you remember how people talk about bankers and so on, they kind of talk about people in crypto in the same sort of group, which is ironic mm -hmm. because actually the people in crypto are actually the rebels of that industry, right? They're the ones who basically sort of railed against the establishment and basically created an alternative system precisely because they were against the establishment. That's how it actually started. And now we've got the establishment back in, but that's <clears throat> now beside this, the point. <laughs> great, great. Exactly, right? And, and now the establishment back in, exactly. But I think this is the part where the reaction comes from, mm -hmm. right? So I think it's more of a reaction towards broadly the negative views on capitalism and the fear, right? And many comments say, I don't want my game financified. You know, I don't want money in the game. I don't want it to pervert the gameplay. In some ways, especially sort of freemium gaming in the Western world, is probably one of the very few places where it appears that, you know, you can have sort of a meritocracy. If I'm good at the game, I can have social status, I can succeed, 
and I don't necessarily need money. At least that's what they think. What they don't realize is that their time and attention is heavily financified and monetized off the back on an industry that makes $200 billion a year plus, right? And of which you get nothing for it, even though you help contribute value to that ecosystem. But because they don't see it, they are arbitraged out of this. And by the way, this is what happened in, you know, in Web1, when people were arbitraged out of their knowledge of trades, goods that they could trade. You know, farmers in Asia didn't know what the real value of their goods, whether it's rice or vegetables or whatever, was sold in America, right? And so they were always exploited and they thought life was good. And then they saw the internet and the internet is like, oh, wait a second, my product is being sold for 100x of what actually yeah. I'm being paid. Wait a second, I should be paid more. You know, and that gave rise to the Alibabas and the Ebays and the Amazons of the world as a way to sort of create value there. And then, of course, it allowed for intermediaries to come in to say, you know, if this guy is not willing to pay you a fair share, I will, because there's still money to be made, right? right. So, so this is now what's possible in Web3 with data. And so I think this is, again, the thing that people don't understand, that it's not about the money. It's about the transparency of the ecosystem. The entire financial ecosystem and the trade of whatever assets uh, that happen inside a video game, for instance, now becomes available for everyone to audit and see. So I can see what the game items are worth. I can see who's paying for it. I can see who's paying more on it. I can see what value is generating, which then means I can share value or I can trade with you something along, along that. So it's creating more transparency in the ecosystems. And because I think a lot of people don't understand how money works, that's the other problem. But I would say the world is mostly financially illiterate. They have a bank account, but they have no financial literacy. They don't have an investment yeah, portfolio. They don't teach it in school. They don't sure. teach it in school, you know, and, and so as a result, they're ignorant. And, you know, what's their first experience? Student debt, right? <laughs> which which leads, especially with these interest rates, to another kind of indentured servitude over time. How many years do they have to spend to repay their debt? Right, that's the relationship they have with money. So you can't really say, blame them for being so negative about them. So I think, again, I think this problem needs to be solved, which I think Web3 and crypto can actually help solve. On that note, yeah, we're going to take a quick break and we'll be right back. And we are back. I want to continue the conversation we were having before the break. When it comes to finishing the race to the finish line, so to speak, which region do you think is embracing Web3 the best or more specifically NFTs? Well, definitely the Asia Pacific region is embracing NFTs faster than any other region. And you can see that mm -hmm. it's basically, you know, even from the policy standpoint, it's not even just from the population standpoint. You know, it's uh, Hong Kong itself has basically embraced digital assets. You know, Japan and the prime minister himself has put metaverse and NFTs and Web3 on the map. Right. I mean, even China has put out a Web3 strategy paper a white paper. And, you know, Xi Jinping himself has said how blockchain and Web3 is, you know, kind of the future of the internet. He, of course, did not make any mention of crypto. But, you know, the point is, is that Hong Kong plays a role where, you know, you can have crypto in Hong Kong and not in China. And there's sort of this gateway effect that's taking place there. So, you know, take that hint as you will. <laughs> but the point basically <laughs> being that there is clearly a push forward in terms of pushing Web3 technologies, including NFTs and generally sort of digital assets in this space. Uh, and the Middle East is kind of the same as well. The Middle East is pushing that heavily as well. It's not just the UAE. I mean, it's Turkey. And now you know, recently with their partnership with Neo in Saudi, they partnered with us because precisely because they want to sort of enter into the Web3 world. And I think there's really a couple of thematics around here that, that drive this. The first one, obviously, is a broad thematic around sort of not wanting to have too much dependency on the US economy and on the dollar, right? So I think that's something that a lot of countries have sort of had concern around. So I think, you know, Web3, particularly digital assets and crypto, provide an alternative towards that. And then I think the second one is, of course, uh, which I think is a bigger issue, is the fact that if you think about it, almost all of the world, with the exception of the ones that have closed the ecosystems, have been hastily become digital dependence on technology from American businesses, right? So in other words, whether it's Facebook or whether it's Amazon or whether it's Microsoft, whether it's Google, you name it, Apple, right? Basically, you know, all of the world, you know, whether it's Europe or whether it's, uh, you know, Asia Pacific has actually become dependent on, you know, basically these very powerful, you know, as we call them sort of, you know, entities, right? yeah, feudal digital, you know, entities as it will. Figure down, right. I say feudal because a couple of years ago, I would quote the comment where, you know, Facebook essentially censored Australian media effectively when Australia said, hey, you got to pay us something. And oh, look what happened in Canada just say a couple of weeks ago, right? You know, I mean, the point is that if you can actually censor an entire nation's basically media output, how is that okay? 
Like, why is there a private corporation that even feels entitled that it can do that in the sake of profits as opposed to, you know, for the broader benefit? This is, wasn't possible before. I mean, you couldn't do that. So I think this is kind of the situation we have. And now imagine if you have that happening even in Western democracies, you know, what happens in other countries around the world where the interest, the national interest of the country is not at all in the corporate interest of the company in question, right? So, the, so, so either you ban them, or you basically are dependent on them and you can't ensure that they have a national interest in mind. And so that's another reason why I think many of these countries are pushing Web3 technologies because they see it as a way to essentially break themselves free from sort of this Web2 dominance. And in the sort of, you know, to the extent that their own businesses that they're building won't necessarily be the winners in the space because that's not how it works. You know, by creating, by participating in a decentralized network is broadly a better outcome uh, rather than basically being in a centralized network that can basically make these decisions that are sort of against your interests, right? So, so that's kind of, you know, another reason why uh, countries like Asia are sort of accelerating in this area because they have witnessed what happened to them, you know, in the last 10 years and they don't like it. So that could drive it for Asia and the Middle East, as you mentioned, but what about the U.S.? Like, what are they getting wrong or not understanding that is kind of inhibiting them? Is it the regulatory environment or something else? I mean, I think it's definitely the regulatory environment, particularly with the SEC, has not been helpful. It's very clear mm -hmm. that the policy or the lack of policy making, shall we say, has created uh, definitely a sentiment of fear, uncertainty and doubt, right? FUD for classic. I think that's the effect that they're looking to do because, you know, one of the biggest problems you create when you have you know, these elements of, you know, fear and, and then uncertainty is that people start to self-censor, right? People start to stop doing the things they think is right because they have to start second guessing. Is that the right thing to do? It's like a chilling Should effect. I do this? I don't really know. And actually the insidious part about that is suddenly you're silencing yourself, uh, you know, right. which of course is a very un-American thing. <laughs> but when you're worried about it, uh, when you don't know. It becomes more serious. Yeah, yeah, it becomes more serious. It suddenly becomes part of your culture. And suddenly you're just like, you know, you're just shy to start. And next thing you know, you don't even get up, right? And, you know, we've seen this happen in other places around the world. And it's very sad to see that, you know, the U.S. is going through this at the moment. However, never count out the U.S. Because, because of its history, the U.S. is obviously built by people who are pretty feisty, and pretty combative. And they absolutely, for those who believe that they know what's right, they'll fight for it and they'll go to court, they do whatever. And that's what's happened, right? And you have, you know, the US has champions like Coinbase, for instance, right? Or the guys at Masari or those guys who basically, you know, paying and sort of doing the good fight in the US and pushing the industry forward. And now, you know, with the court victory on Bitcoin spot ETFs, it forced the SEC essentially to allow that to happen. Begrudgingly so, one might add. I know I think Gary Gensler was very, very clear to say. Just because we approve the ETFs doesn't mean we approve of crypto, <laughs> right? You know, right, yeah. you know, like it's not an endorsement <laughs> of Bitcoin. Let's just be clear about that. Sure. Okay, fine. Yeah. Right. And I think that's, that is a beautiful thing about the US that you can still have disagreement. The fact that, you know, just because one, one entity says no, doesn't mean the rest of the entities uh, have to agree. Right. You know, and, and when the US comes back into full force, which we believe will happen maybe in the next 12 to 18 months, right? You know, maybe post-elections, not sure. Then, you know, we should be very wary of how aggressively the U.S. will move because of its capital, because of its talent, because of its speed. And frankly, you know, I think crypto and Web3 is about as American as it gets, right? <laughs> Which is, you know, like in terms of property rights and liberty and freedom and everything that it sort of purports for the digital world, you know, it's very much in speaking of, I would say, the values of the American constitution and sort of the American way of life. So I think once that's fully understood, I think U.S. will have a very big competitive advantage because it's, I think, in the nature of most Americans. But I think there's a misunderstanding because, because of all of the media and the news. And, you know, something else that I was told as well, which I'm not quite sure, but it's some, an interesting comment. I think that there is also a little bit of a... Um, a sort of a classist undertone as well that's happening in the US as well, right? Between people of, let's call them traditional and old money and the Web3 crypto folks who are really, you know, frankly, new money and also maybe not from sources that normally have made money before. And they suddenly emerged with wealth and they're just like, right. oh, so I'm now in this social class, but I don't look this way or I'm not 
part of that group, right? right? And, you know, Silicon Valley went through that experience 20, 30 years ago, right? There was a sort of rejection of, oh, you know, these guys in sweatpants and sort of engineers. But now they're like the top. But now, but now they're <laughs> the establishment, right? right? Yeah. So, so you're kind of going through these cycles. So I think, I think there's a little bit of that as well, right? Um, and I think when we look at some of the Democratic uh, Party sort of politics around this, you know, you have to wonder sometimes, you know, where that translates to in terms of people's impressions. I mean, you know, one of the things that always puzzled me, you know, when SPF was, you know, first got into trouble, <clears throat> and I think everyone in Asia was basically just writing this guy off as a fraud because it was pretty clear. But American media struggled so hard for a time to sort of make sense of it, right? They spoke and they, they said, oh, you know, it's mm -hmm. it's a Chinese because somehow CZ was somehow Chinese or, you know, it's crypto, the industry is bad and he's just caught up in sort of, you know, this bad industry. He's a good guy. It's like, why? Like, why are they trying to sort of, you know, to justify this criminal. And, and I think it has a little bit to do with the fact that he came from, I guess, that class that was supposed to be the good guys, right? He, you know, his, his family was academic royalty, effectively, right? He had a background that sort of, you know, right. was endearing to, to his experience, you know, and all the experiences. The investors, MIT, and the MBTs, everything. And MIT, yeah. everything put together. How can someone like that, you know, be a criminal, right? How can this happen, right? It must be something else, right? So I think there's a little bit of that undertone, right? That that's happened as well. And I think also America, frankly, is in a little bit of a soul searching of its own identity. I mean, the politics that your country is going through right now, from an external perspective, <laughs> seems to show. Right? It's another yeah, conversation. It's another conversation. But but I think I think I think right. these effects are coming out but in true. different ways. And and and, and so Web three is caught between that. You know? Yeah. Well, it'll be interesting to see how that kind of all plays out. We're almost at time here. So I want to make sure I could ask you our last question. We always ask our guests this. If there's one piece of advice that you can leave our listeners with, what would that be? Well, I mean, I think maybe the one that I generally sort of like to live by is sort of my own personal advice, right? Which is that, you know, generally speaking, I like to live my life with, you know, building with impact and purpose. And in this sense, you know, I mean, positive impact. So normally in the past, I wouldn't add the word positive <laughs> just because of the fact that uh, it's it's, now, yeah. it would be implied. But, you know, in this case, I just want to make very, very clear that I mean positive impact, right? Just in case the people that <laughs> misunderstand. Um, but yeah, uh, impact and, and purpose, I think, are really important for us. And I think if you can, you know, whatever it is that you do in life, it doesn't have to be crypto, it doesn't have to be Web3. If you're building with a view of something that has impact and purpose, then I think, um, you know, you'll build something great. Uh, and you may not hit it off the park on day one, right? But to me, when you try to build something with impact and purpose, you'll end up building something or trying to build towards something that is, you know, greater than you. And, you know, that is a thing that then allows us to have the kind of energy and effort that allows us to get out of bed, to be excited about the future, to build a world, you know, potentially, you know, with potential and hope, because you know you're building something that's just, you know, bigger than you. And I know it sounds corny, but it is actually something that sort of gives me energy. And, you know, I'm able to go to all these conferences and talk to all these people and have all these podcasts late at night or whatever it is, <laughs> precisely because I am right. so excited about, the, in our case, the prospect of giving digital property rights to everyone in the world in the digital context. And I also believe that we can save capitalism because, you know, we can give people a form of equity in this world because we can now all own a piece of this Web3 world, which you couldn't do in Web2. And that's really exciting. You know, I think we can all consider ourselves very lucky if we actually find that purpose. I mean, I would sort of definitely ask everyone if they they want to have an impact to find that for themselves. I love that. Well, thank you for sharing that. And thank you for coming on the show today. I really appreciate it. My pleasure. Thank you for having me. We'll be back next week with conversations around what's going on in the wild world of Web3 with top players in the crypto ecosystem. You can keep up with us on Spotify, Apple Music, or your favorite pod platform and subscribe to our companion newsletter, also called Chain Reaction. Links to the newsletter and stories we talked about can be found in our show notes. And be sure to follow us at Chain underscore Reaction on Twitter. Chain Reaction is hosted by myself, Jacqueline Melanick, and produced by Maggie Stamets, with assistance from Yashad Kulkarni and editing by Kel. Bryce Durbin is our illustrator, and Henry Picavet manages TechCrunch audio products. Thanks for listening in. See you next time.